Well, greetings and welcome to our video service for the third Sunday of Advent, coming to you from Trinity Episcopal Church in Lumberton, North Carolina. service begins on page 323 in the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgiveth all our sins. His mercy endureth forever. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to thee, O Lord. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? The reed shaken by the wind? And what then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet it, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Well, we can imagine the background of today's reading. John's cell is dark and dank. Prison cells usually are. He probably paced back and forth, troubled less by his chains than by his misgivings. Allowed at last to see one of his followers, he sends the man to carry a message, a question really, that will settle his doubts once and for all. All that was left now was to wait, to wait, and see whether he had spent his life in vain. Given that setting, has it ever occurred to you what an odd choice this gospel reading is? And after all, we are now at the third week of Advent, less probably than two weeks from Christmas. By this time, most of us have, if we are going to, bought our trees and decorated our houses and perhaps been to a holiday party, gotten a good jump on our Christmas shopping. So it's not surprising that when we come to church, we expect similar progress in the scriptures that we read. We heard from John the Baptist last week, and now it's time for Mary and Joseph, isn't it? Or the angels, or the shepherds, or something else that will help us get into the Christmas spirit. No. But no, whoever is responsible for choosing our readings has gotten their sense of timing all wrong, haven't they? Instead of preparing us for the birth of the babe at Bethlehem, they have jumped ahead some 10 chapters and maybe 30 years into the middle of Matthew's account of Jesus' ministry. Is that an odd choice? No. According to Matthew, John the Baptist, the fire and brimstone preacher of repentance, is now in prison. Some months have passed since he baptized Jesus and proclaimed him as the chosen one. Having heard about what Jesus has been up to in the meantime, John apparently has been having second thoughts. So he sends his disciples to ask Jesus quite plainly, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Well, that does seem a little strange. An Advent passage about John and his doubts. Except, well, maybe in the midst of all the planning and the shopping and the celebrating, 
that we've been frantically doing, there does seem to be a greater amount of doubt and fear at this time of the year. Physicians and psychologists and pastors all report an increase in requests for counseling admission. Mental health facilities are busy and suicides peak right in the midst of the holiday season. So John, it would seem, is not alone in his troubles, his doubts. Be fair, John's failure of confidence shouldn't really surprise us. He is, after all, in prison. And so far, what he predicted and what he longed for has just not happened. Because when John announced the coming of God's kingdom and proclaimed Jesus as God's anointed, you see, he expected the world to change. And now, some months or perhaps years later, things seem all too dreadfully to be the same. To put it another way, what John saw in Jesus was the climax of all God's promises to Israel. And now he is sitting alone in a prison cell. He is waiting for that promise to be kept. And so John is concerned and most likely disappointed. And so it's an odd selection for us to hear because this is not the John that we heard from last week, is it? But looking at John this way makes him more sympathetic and useful as a character for this time of year, I think. Because aren't we also still waiting for the consummation of, of Christmas's promise? I mean, isn't it precisely what is so wonderful about Christmas? Promises of peace on earth, goodwill. All of that is also so difficult about Christmas as well. As the headlines, sometimes even our homes regularly make it clear that peace and goodwill are scarce commodities today, just as they were a few months or years or a millennia ago. And so try as we might to deny the darkness of the season in our spirits by adding candles to the wreaths or presents under the tree, all it takes is the loss of a friend or a job or a loved one to sort of prick our good cheer bubble, leave us in a funk as dark and dank as John's prison cell. And when this happens, we as well are at best concerned and often disappointed, disappointed with ourselves, disappointed with the world, and even disappointed with God, which feels all the worse at Christmas time, which is what I think makes this an important subject. With all this in mind, I wonder how John received Jesus' answer. Quite frankly, I doubt it was very satisfying. Jesus instructs John's disciples to go and to tell him what they have heard and seen. But I mean, come on, John already knew what Jesus was doing, and that's precisely what had provoked his doubts in the first place. Nor, I imagine, would John take much comfort in the rest of Jesus' answer. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Well, what kind of an answer is that? Certainly it's not what John expected from Jesus. What John most likely looked for, and truth be told, but most of the time we look for as well, is a strong Messiah for a strong people, a Messiah who helps those who help themselves, a Messiah who knows how to stand up for himself, a Messiah, in short, that you can be proud of. And what he gets 
Instead, is Jesus. And measured against John's hopes and expectations, Jesus probably fails, disappointingly short of the mark. Let's face it, the people Jesus seems preoccupied with, the lame, the deaf, the poor, the ill, the dead. I mean, these folks aren't exactly the movers and shakers of the world, are they? Whether they are those who are moved and shaken by the world, by every whim of the rich and powerful. These people weren't going to change things. They're social outcasts and economic losers. In John's day, kind of people who can barely fend for themselves, much less help anybody else. So why in the world then does Jesus make such a fuss about these folks when John, apparently at the time, was at the end of his rope? And he asked for some sign, some little indication. Jesus is the one for whom John was waiting. Well, maybe it's that all these folks do share one thing in common with John. And that is their vulnerability and their need. So think about it. There's John pacing and pondering in his cell who suddenly, despite his earlier fame, despite his charismatic personality, despite all of his followers, despite even his mighty faith, nonetheless finds himself in a position of absolute need. And in this way, he discovers that he is in complete solidarity with all of those in need, the poor, the lame, the outcast, and all others who can boast of nothing except their dependence on God, on God's own grace and mercy and protection. And here, I think, we find a clue to the last part of Jesus' answer to John as well, part about not being offended by Jesus. Because to the degree to which we claim to have made it on our own, to not need anything that we cannot earn or make or hoard for ourselves, to that degree, we will undoubtedly take offense at Jesus. The one born in a stable, laid in a feeding trough, and ultimately hanged on a cross for us. But at just the same time, to the degree to which we admit our need, and identify with all those who depend on God, to that degree we discover in Jesus a God who is once and for all, for us. I know this can be a frightening and terrifying thing in some ways. We live in a world that simply preys on weak people. Not surprisingly, from early on, we're taught to trust no one, to take nothing for granted, cover all the bases. And so when push comes to shove, we regularly try to hide our insecurities and fears behind our houses or our careers, or for that matter, our failings and infirmities. That is until the word cancer or downsized, or divorce, is breed. And then we know ourselves to be just as fragile and vulnerable as anyone else. And at these moments, which seem to be much more common at this time of year, the words Jesus speaks offers us a measure of comfort. This is what we prepare for during the season. As Christ, our Emmanuel, God draws near to us in the flesh and the blood of that poor babe to take on our lot in our life so that we may know of God's promise to be with us and for us forever. And so while Matthew's portrayal of John 
and his doubts is striking, even startling. Maybe it's not so odd to hear about it at Christmas. And we, as well, at times, feel stuck between God's promises made and God's promises kept. And when we, as well, at times, know ourselves to live in between Christ's first coming of Bethlehem and his second in glory. And we, as well, at times, disappointed by ourselves and disappointed by the world, even God, find ourselves whispering a prayer as desperate as it is ancient and simple. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Those moments we know that whatever our misgivings, whatever our disappointments, God is not disappointed in us and comes to us anyway, eager to join us in our weaknesses, to hold on to us in our insecurity, to comfort us in our fear. For God and Jesus came not for the strong and the powerful and the proud, but to the weak and the vulnerable. God and Jesus, in other words, came for us. So there is John, a few weeks short of Christmas, still pacing and pounding the few steps around his short prison space, wondering, worrying whether Jesus is really the one. And when all of a sudden there is a knock, an entrance, and the delivery of a long-awaited response to a heartfelt question, John, I imagine his disciple telling him, Jesus told me to tell you that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at him. I wonder if John got it. I hope we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.